Good morning. Welcome to Missions Week. Uh, the video you're seeing behind me is our staff, and it's Pastor Tyler. He can get dirty some days. And uh, our staff just kicked off Missions Week. We actually uh, went ahead this last week. I was gone to Brazil, as some of you may know, on, uh, on a personal trip and also for some PhD studies. And uh, our staff actually got to go to the community food pantry this last Monday. Now, this is just a little taste of what's going to begin tomorrow. In fact, what's beginning today as our church family engages with missions all over the world, literally starting here as we're going to serve at several of our different partners' locations and also as you support international missions. This is just an opportunity for you to know, hey, it doesn't take much and it's simple to serve the Lord with gladness. So Missions Week has started today. One of the things that we like to emphasize during Missions Week is our global focus, and literally our global and local focus. And this is just a little taste of our local focus that you can participate in. How many of you have signed up for Missions Week already? All right, there's several of you. If you have not yet signed up, there is a great opportunity for you to sign up to serve with what, we, what is called Mission Reagan. And Mission Reagan, I'm going to read from their website so you know exactly what they stand for. In fact, uh, last year when I went to Cuba, and we actually have a team of about eight people that are going to Cuba in April. Praise God for that, right? It's going to be such an amazing time. And uh, we actually took some items from Mission Reagan that was donated to take to Cuba because literally, they, guys, they have absolutely no supplies in Cuba. And here's what Mission Reagan's vision is, is the vision of Mission Reagan is to share the love of Christ both locally and globally. I think they stole that from us, just saying. By collecting sur surplus medical supplies from those who have plenty and sharing them with those in need. So that's Mission Reagan. And if you want to be a part of that, you certainly can this week. Just sign up online uh, or actually not online. Just call us at the uh, church office and we will make sure that you can uh, participate. So Missions Week, again, kicked off today. Last year, we actually had Mission Sunday and we're up, upping the ante a little bit. We're, uh, you know, going to the next level with our mission. Council that has spent a lot of time, especially Jeff Womack, has spent a ton of hours. Can we just give Jeff Womack a, a thank you for all the work he's done? Fantastic work, and uh, and also our team. We really have, uh, I mean, we have amazing people here that have done that. So right now, what I want to do is go ahead and invite Mark Howell to come up to the stage. Uh, this morning, uh, I want to emphasize to you a few ministries. And uh, beginning first, though, before I get to Mark, I want to tell you uh, about um, the uh, work that Chain of Love is doing in Brazil. Unfortunately, Robin Henstad, uh, that many of you know, had a, a personal incident. Uh, involving her son Drew, and uh, he's okay. He just had a, something that happened uh, yesterday, so she called me and said, hey, I cannot be at church tomorrow morning. They're actually managing that. Uh, they're fine. Just pray for them and for peace. Now, uh, I, this is personal to me. As you guys know, I literally was at Chain of Love a few days ago. I was in Brazil. In fact, my wife and I are going through a process of, of adopting a girl from Chain of Love. Her name is Julia. And uh, I was there exactly at that, actually that room right there. And uh, so it was a fantastic time. Chain of Love is a uh, ministry that has several different homes. They work in the foster system in Brazil. And it's just an amazing time. I actually was told, I actually had met Victoria. Victoria has been... Uh, at Chain of Love for a few years now. I didn't know this about her, but my uh, parents were with me at Chain of Love, and they opened up to, uh, to each other. And uh, what I found out was that Victoria was sold when she was six years old by her parents for 300 hay eyes, which literally is about, I would say, probably $30. And then her grandpa found out about it because her mom was uh, a drug addict. Her grandpa found out about it and then went and bought her back because the guy wouldn't give her back for a thousand hay eyes. And so you can imagine that's a lot of money for them. And that took place. And then eventually then she was raised by uh, her grandparents who both died and then she wound up a chain of love. That's just one story. 
out of the 100 plus kids that live a chain of love. And Robin Henstad, who is a member of our church, is super dedicated to chain of love. She's done a tremendous job uh, at making sure that our churches, our churches in the U.S., and including our church, are partnering with them for the sake of uh, the gospel, for the glory of God, and so that these lives, these kids can be changed. And this is just several of you. How many of you have been a chain of love? Raise your hand real quick. There's several of you. If you have not been, please make time to go. It will truly impact your life. Now let me move on to you, Mark. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Welcome. And uh, Mark, uh, we're blessed to have you and your wife, Carmen, as members here at Cross Point. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So Carmen and I have been married 32 years this year. And we have two daughters. And I have one son-in-law and a Labrador retriever named Obadiah. Obadiah, my, wow. Now, my wife is, my wife is going to tell you that I named the dog, but I didn't tell you my daughter's name. So my daughter's names are Abigail and Rebecca, <laughs> and uh, they both serve the Lord. We live in Van Alstine. Did you, did you actually get a visa to get here? <laughs> yeah. I'm just uh, Mark, no, the preaching is so good that we're willing to drive to the ends of the earth. Yeah, Matt, Pastor Matt that preached last That's week. That's right. Yeah, okay, great. Um, <laughs> E2 is entering its third year, so can you tell us a little, about, a little bit about it and how it all came together? I mean, it would be great for us to, yeah, absolutely. to know the story. So I'm the executive director of a ministry we started three and a half years ago called the E2 Initiative. The two E's stand for equip and encourage, and we exist for the 85% of pastors worldwide that lack any type of training or education. They don't just not have access to it, they don't have any access at all whatsoever, even online. And so we had a burden knowing that God had given us the privilege to learn a lot through seminary and personal training that we wanted to share what God had with us with those pastors. And so three and a half years ago at the most logical time uh, in the middle of COVID, we stepped out of pastoring. We, I had pastored for 25 years and we stepped out on faith and launched the E2 initiative. And so now we're three and a half years in and we're in about six different countries around the world. Fantastic. And in fact, uh, when we went to Cuba last year, you were That's with right. me, and uh, Mark did some training there, and it was wonderful. So you have a slightly different focus than most foreign mission organizations in that you have geared support um, to pastors in their outreach work, and also uh, not in, instead of like doing outreach directly, you're mm-hmm. literally training pastors. So how have you seen the support uh, begin to manifest itself since you started E2? Well, you know, we have a saying, you know, if you want to know the temperature of a church, you put a thermometer in the mouth of the pastor. I mean, a church will never rise above the theological temperature of the leader or above the spiritual temperature of the leader. And simply put, healthy leaders grow healthy churches and theologically grounded leaders grow theologically uh, grounded churches. And so our focus is really to invest in those who lead the local church. Uh, And what we have discovered is that pastors around the world not only need the equipping aspect, but they're struggling. They need the encouragement. In fact, 80% of pastors' families say that they were not prepared for what they experienced in ministry. Ministry is very difficult. And one of the things that we have learned over these last three and a half years is that pastors are really struggling. They want the education, and we're able to bring them that education but they simply want the presence of a person or people to come alongside of them and just say, hey, we love you, we're a safe place, you can share with us the burdens of your own heart and the burdens of your family. Right, and you know, it's interesting you said that, as you were saying that, I was thinking, at Chain of Love, I met, I, I was interacting with my parents, with the couple that is actually, they're the parents for Julia's home, and they literally have 12 children, besides their two, <laughs> that they manage, and that, you know, I I thought about pastors. Sometimes pastors overseas, they have so many responsibilities because ministry is difficult overseas, especially when you have no resources, and especially when you're in a context where, you know, um, you just have to rely on a lot of support from the outside, and I know that your support from the outside makes a huge difference. In fact, you went to Ukraine and to Romania. You had uh, uh, a ministry there to pastors. You encouraged them, but you also, tell us a second here that you went with Kirk Kirk, you're right here. Wave wave your hand. There he is. He went with Kirk to Papua New Guinea. Can you tell us about that for a second? Right. So we just returned on Thursday. So we're here in presence, but our spirit is somewhere over the (laughs) Pacific Ocean 
uh, this morning, but uh, we had an incredible opportunity. I made my fourth trip back to Papua, which is about as far as you can go to the ends of the earth. And I was privileged on this trip to take with me Kurt Lauterbach, who provided an incredible ministry of eyeglasses to the pastors, the churches, and the people that, Ooh, we, I were, see it. I that see we were serving there. I see it. Uh, at our conference, see what I did there? <laughs> at our conference, we had about 87 pastors and leaders that attended the conference, but Kirk single-handedly gave out 210, 218, 218, he wanted to correct me, I kept downplaying the number, but 218 pairs of eyeglasses, that is wow. eye Praise exams. Praise God for yeah. that, that's great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. great. And his ministry... His ministry to those pastors in those churches lends credibility to what we're doing right. at E2. You know, they know that we have the information to share, but they want to know that we care. And so I'm grateful for Crosspoint and its investment in E2, but also the investment that we have from church members like Kirk. You know, he's not a professional pastor, although they were calling him Pastor Kirk. So I think oh, he's wow. been... you've been upgraded. I, I think he's been elevated to that, but <laughs> we could not do what we do without the help of our own local church and without people who are willing to go with us and just invest in those who serve Great, our churches. Great, you ran right into my last question is how we can uh, partner with you. I, if someone is sitting out there and they're like, how do I partner with E2? Right. And uh, maybe by prayer, or maybe by financial support, or maybe by going. Right. Uh, how can they do that real quick, and then we'll pray. Sure. E2initiative.org is our website, or you can find me. I would love to introduce you to these pastors all around the world. You say, well, I don't know what I have to offer them. You can offer yourself to them. Right. They simply need to know that people care and love them. And so if you're interested in learning more about E2 or connecting with us, we'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. Uh, what you may not know is that actually Mark is going to preach this morning and bring us God's word. And I think you'll be super encouraged. So what I want to do is uh, pray for him and uh, we will get right into the sermon. Father, thank you so much for Mark and the E2 initiative and for the work, Lord, that they have done over the years and how you have used them for the sake of the gospel and for your glory. And Lord, I pray that now as he preaches, Lord, as he um, comes to the pulpit, Lord, that you will allow him by the, the power of your Holy Spirit to speak your word to us and to encourage us, Lord, for the sake of the gospel and for the work of your ministry, Lord, not only here locally, but also globally, Lord, as we partner together for your name's sake. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Well, I do want to say to you this morning how grateful I am for my home church. You know, when I left the pastorate, we had to find a church, and we visited many churches, and the Lord was gracious to us to lead us to Cross Point Church. And I want to tell you that I'm not only grateful for Daniel Messina as my pastor, but I'm grateful for him as a friend and for the opportunity to share in God's Word today. While we were talking, you saw some pictures on the screen. Those were from our trip. We just Turned home again on Thursday night. But I want to invite you, if you would, to take your Bibles today and find the book of Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. And in just a moment, I want to read verses 1 through 10. And then we're going to consider for a few moments this morning the subject, he's got your whole world in his hands. So we'll be in Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 10, though we'll be looking at the entire chapter for the next few moments. Let's listen to what the Lord says. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing 
as though it had been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. It was several years ago I was sitting on an airplane making my way back from an international trip where we were training leaders, as you know, when you travel to the ends of the earth, it's not very glamorous flying on an airplane for hour upon hour upon hour. And especially when you're on your way home, your one objective is to make it home. You just want to get home. I landed in San Francisco. I was waiting for my plane. It was going to be a late flight, a red eye from San Francisco. At the time, I was pastoring in Florida, and I was about to take a cross-country journey. I was exhausted, I was tired, I was miserable, I was no fun to be around. Thankfully, I was traveling by myself. I was about to board the airplane, and I was thinking to myself, Lord, if you have mercy, if you are God in heaven, then please allow there to be a middle seat open between those on the aisle and me at the window. Well, sure enough, I got onto the airplane, I sat in my window seat, I pulled up my pillow and I was ready to go to sleep, and somebody came and sat in the aisle seat. And I thought, well, good, there's going to be an empty middle seat, and you know how it is, if you're on an airplane, you're watching people coming down the aisle, and you're thinking, is that person going to sit next to me? And nobody was coming, and I thought they were getting ready to close the door and that I was going to be able to make it. When all of a sudden, this man, about six feet, 10 inches tall, very large man, could have played offensive lineman for the San Francisco 49ers, was walking down the aisle. And I thought, dear Lord in heaven, please do not allow him to sit next to me on this long flight. And God said, Mark, remember all the sin in your life? I am about to judge you for some of it and this man sits down in the middle seat next to me. Well, I thought to myself, I'll just crowd over by the window, I'll pull the blanket over my head, and I won't say anything, and so we taxied away from the gate, taxied, and we started off on our journey. Just about that time, as I was about to fall asleep, I sensed that there was something unusual happening with the man next to me. I opened my eyes, and there in my face is this extremely large hand and this man with a smile on his face looking at me. And he said, hi, my name is Tim. What is your name? And I thought, oh, here we go. It's going to be a long journey. And so he began to talk, and I said, well, Tim, tell me where you are from. He said, I live in Honolulu, Hawaii. I said, well, Tim, what are you doing on an airplane from San Francisco to Florida? He said, I am going on vacation. I said, Tim, you live in Honolulu, Hawaii. What on earth are you doing going to Florida for vacation? And Tim said to me, and I'll never forget, he said, do you know how expensive it is to vacation in Hawaii? You know, we're in bad economic times when somebody has to travel from Hawaii to Florida for vacation. And so I started to ask Tim about his life. And it became very apparent to me very quickly that Tim was a man who was suffering and in great pain. He shared with me about his daughter who was four years old. And without going into detail, I will tell you that this little girl was abducted and she lost her life. Here was a father who was broken at the loss of his daughter with unspeakable horror that happened to them in their family. And he shared his heart with me and he shared the burdens. And suddenly my concerns for a peaceful and a sleep, uh, of, of being able to sleep on the flight faded away. 
But I thought to myself that entire flight, what do I say to a man like Tim? I'm a pastor. I'm seminary educated. I teach pastors. But I do not know what to say to this man. What encouragement can I give him? What words can I say that will change his outlook in his life? It was during that time that I remembered something that I was told many years ago as a pastor, and that is this. Never forget that there is a broken heart in every seat in your church. Now, I don't need to tell all of you that. You know that. There are people all over this room today who have more questions in their life than they have answers. Your problems are greater than your solutions. And what you need is the very same thing that Tim needed. What we need is more than help. We need hope. It's in those dark days when the questions abound and the answers don't come that you and I need something greater than simple platitudes. We need something that remains, something that lasts. We need hope. You remember as children, we would sing a song, he's got the whole world in his hands. You and I know that that is true, at least in our minds we know that it is true. But as we walk through the sorrows of life, the difficulties of life, the tragedies of life, and the complexities of life, we might say, I know that he has the whole world in his hands, but does he have my world in his hands? What about me? Does God care about me? Does he know about me? What can he do for me? Well, this morning in the brief time that we have together, I want to share with you a message of hope and of encouragement. And I want you to understand that God does care about you, and I want to show you how much he cares about you. In the passage that we have opened before us this morning, we are given a glimpse, a picture of heaven. The veil is open, the door is opened, and we are able to look into heaven from the broken world in which we live. And as we gaze into heaven, what we will see is that there is not chaos in heaven. What we will see is an amazing scene playing out before our very eyes. In fact, I would tell you that the scene in Revelation chapter 5 is more than amazing. If you and I can grasp what is happening in this seen, what we find in Revelation chapter 5 is life changing. Now when we turn to the book of Revelation, many of us are confused, many of us stay away from it because of the symbolism. But I want to submit to you as we look at Revelation chapter 5, as we seek to understand what is happening, we need to understand the symbolism, and when we do, the message will become clear. And so what I want you to do with me for just a moment or two is to identify four different observations from the passage, four different images that we see that set the scene for us. I want you to notice, first of all, a powerful king. Notice verse 1, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Now we have to identify who is the one who is seated on the throne. Well, we turn over to chapter 4, just one chapter before this one, and we will note a couple of observations. In chapter 4 and verse 1, we see a door that is standing open, and this door is in heaven. In verse 2, we see that there is a throne in heaven, and there is one who is seated on the throne. And then in verses 2 through 11, we see this incredible picture of worship before the throne. All of heaven worshiping the one who is sitting on the throne. Then as we make our way to verse 11, we see with crystal clear clarity who it is who is seated on the throne. And in verse 11, here is what we find. Worthy are you, O Lord, and our God to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. 
We see now the identity of this powerful king. This powerful king is God. And he is seated on a throne in heaven with all of heaven bowing before him. Notice a second observation. In the hand of him who is seated on the throne is a sealed scroll. Look at verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written on the back and within, and it is sealed with seven seals. Now, eight times in these 14 verses in chapter 5, we read of the scroll. And so this scroll in the hand of God is significant to our understanding. So the question then becomes, what is this scroll? Well, some suggest that this scroll is the title deed of all of the universe. It is the rightful deed that will go to the one for whom and by whom the entire universe was created. A Roman will would be sealed, or a, a Roman deed would be sealed seven times. Others suggest that this is the Lamb's book of life, where the names of every believer, every saint, every person throughout human history who has professed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, where their names are written. Some would say that this is the details of God's plan for final judgment of the wicked. But you see what I believe, though all of those could be true, what I believe, what we see in the hand of God in this scroll is God's ultimate plan and purpose for all of human history. From the beginning of creation to the consummation of the end of, the time, of, the end of times. Your name is in the scroll, my name is in the scroll. All of human history is recorded in this scroll, and this scroll represents God's purposes and plans for the world. Now let me see if I can make it a little more focused on where we live. In this scroll, in the palm of God's hand, is the answer to a 7th century B.C. prophet's prayer where he prayed in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Let me paraphrase the words of Habakkuk. God, do you really care about this messed up world? Do you really care about us? Do you really care about me? How long will you allow the complexities, the tragedies, the difficulties of life to continue. When, God, are you going to step in and make every wrong right? When are you going to put an end to evil? You see, the contents of this scroll are for every wife who has stood over the grave of her husband and has cried out, is there more beyond this life? The contents of this scroll is for every martyr or missionary whose life was snuffed out by those who hated their message. The contents of this scroll are for men like Tim, whose child was taken away from him through reprehensible horror and tragedy. The contents of this scroll are for every person who has said in their heart or said out loud, God, when, will there, be, when will, will there be no more death, no more sorrow, no more tears? You see, the contents of this scroll is for all of us. We say, God, I know you have the whole world in your hand, but do you have my world in your hand? Now, I want you to look carefully at verse 2 through verse four. Because in the palm of God's hand is this scroll, the plan of God for all of human history, the writing of all wrongs. And yet John says that there is a search that goes out in heaven. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And notice what happens in verse four. This is John who was receiving this vision who is recording these words, John says, I wept loudly. Some translations say, I wept bitterly. In other words, it wasn't mere tears, he was sobbing. Because the drama that is playing out in heaven reminds us that we need someone to open the scroll, to unravel the mysteries of life and death, the brokenness that's all over this room, 
the fear, the anxiety, the pain, the sorrow that comes with walking in a fallen earth. All of us need someone to open this scroll. If this scroll is not opened, then you and I today are simply wasting our time. If this scroll remains sealed, then you and I have no hope. We have nothing to say when walking through sorrow or tragedy. We simply say that we are victims of blind fate and then we die and it's all over. Is there more to our lives? And so we see the one seated on the throne, we see the sealed scroll, but I want you to notice thirdly, we see a sacrificial lamb. So look what happens in verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, this is a reference to Genesis chapter 49, verse 8 through 12, and the root of David, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. These are messianic promises in the Old Testament that are now being fulfilled in the New Testament. John, stop crying There is one who is worthy to open the scroll. He is the lion from the tribe of Judah, and he is the one who has come from the house of David who will sit on an everlasting throne. So look what happens, verse six. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Now watch this. John is told by the angel that the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David has prevailed. So what does John do? He turns and he expects to see a what? A lion. Because lions conquer. Lions right all the wrongs. Lions are powerful. Lions are ferocious. He looks to see a lion who can conquer all of the problems that our world is experiencing. But watch what John sees. He turns and looks and he sees not a lion, but he sees a lamb. But I want to submit to you that John is not just seeing a lamb, John is seeing that the lion is the lamb. You see, the one who conquers is the lamb. How unthinkable, our world says we need power, we need might, we need the White House, we need the Congress. You know, we need the right people in the right places to pull the right strings to help us solve solve all of our problems. And yet this vision points us to a slaughtered lamb. You see, the solution to John's problem and the solution to our problem is that we don't need another earthly king, we need a slaughtered lamb. This lamb is described very carefully in verse six and seven. Notice it says that he was standing as though he had been slain with seven horns. Horns are symbols of power. Seven is a number of perfection. He has perfect power with seven eyes. Eyes mean that he can see with perfect uh, omniscience and the seven spirits of God. This is his omnipresence. This lamb is the son of God. This lamb is Jesus, the lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world. This is the savior who purchased our salvation by his own blood. So we see the king on the throne, we see the sealed scrolls, we see the sacrificial lamb, and very quickly I want you to notice the new song. What happens? Well, all of heaven erupts in a song In verse 9 and 10, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you are slain by and by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and every people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. I want you to notice that this new song leads us to one life-changing truth. What is this passage about? And here it is. And here is why I am so grateful that you are here today. There is nothing in your life or my life, there is no one more important than the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it is by his blood that our sins are forgiven. 
It is with his righteousness that we are clothed, and it is in his presence that all tribes and languages, people and nations will one day worship. You see, what do you say to a man like Tim? What do you say to people like us who are walking through tragedy and difficulty and sorrow and pain? What do we say? What we say to them is the message that John saw in this beautiful chapter. And that is, there is a slaughtered lamb who has prevailed. There is a slaughtered savior who shed his blood so that we might one day stand in his presence. Do you believe that? You say this is Mission Sunday, Brother Mark, I thought you might get away without talking about missions. What stands between the king on the throne and the new song? A, a lamb who was slain. What stands between John's tears and the new song that he sings with all of heaven? The lamb who was slain. What stands between your sorrows and everlasting hope? The lamb who was slain. What stands between your sin that separates you from God and spending eternity with God? The lamb who was slain. Let me ask you a question as we close this morning. If somebody came up to you and said, hey, I, um, tomorrow, I'd like to spend the entire day with you. Can you go ahead and put me down to spend the entire day with you? You would say, wait, time out. You want to spend the entire day with me tomorrow? Yeah, I want to spend the entire day with you. Well, what's it about? Well, I don't know. I just want to spend the entire day with you. You would say, listen, I'm not going to spend the entire day with you, and I probably won't spend 15 minutes with you if you don't tell me the reason that you want to spend time with me. And so we would say, absolutely not. If you're not going to give me the purpose, I'm not going to give you a whole afternoon. It's a waste of time. Unless you tell me why, I don't want to spend any time with you. It's only logical, isn't it? We don't want to spend time with somebody if they don't tell us why they want us to spend time with them. Well, let me rephrase the question. What's your life about? What's your marriage about? Students, what's, what, what, what's your going to school all about? I mean, I mean, what's it all about? You say, well, I want to have a career. I want to get an education. I want to go to college. I want to, get a, I want to have, make money. I, I, what, what, what's that all about? What's it for? What, what do you want to accomplish? What's the meaning of your life? What, at the end of your life, will make a difference whether you lived or didn't live? You see, there are a lot of people who don't have any clue why you're alive. You don't have any clue what the purpose of your life is. I tell this to people all the time. The difference, the two great days that make the biggest difference in your life are number one, when you realize that there was a lamb who was slain so that you might find forgiveness and, and, and redemption. And the second greatest day is when you figure out what that means. So if you wouldn't spend the day with someone because they don't tell you what the purpose is, why are you living your life if you don't know what the purpose of your life is? Church, I want you to see the reason for this worship that takes place in heaven is because of the transforming death of Jesus. It's not his teaching or his compassion or his power. The reason that worship takes place in heaven is because of the shedding of his blood. Peter says, we are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without fault. There is no voice, there is no advice that can transform the human heart more than to understand that we who deserve death are given life at the cost of the shed blood of Jesus. And that calls forth this new song of redemption. There are a hundred voices that you will hear this week that will tell you the meaning of your life, from Oprah to Dr. Phil to Taylor Swift. 
but there is only one person who can bring about God's purposes for transforming your life, who can bring about ultimate justice, and who can provide forgiveness. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he is the lamb of God. You see, what stands between you and knowing the reason for your life is the Lamb of God. And there is nothing and there is no one more important than Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me all around this room? With your heads bowed and your heart stilled before the Lord, this morning I want to ask you two questions. The first is, have you ever invited the Lord Jesus Christ to save you? Have you ever said, Lord Jesus, today I need the forgiveness that only you can bring? And today I bow my heart before you and I ask you to forgive my sin. Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. Help me even in the complexities of life, to continue to sing with all of heaven the new song of redemption. One day with every tribe and language and people and nation, you can stand before the throne and say, worthy is the lamb who was slain, who redeemed me. The next question I have for you is, do you understand what it means to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know the meaning and the purpose of your life? Your marriage should be centered on Jesus. Your job should be centered on Jesus. Our church should be centered on Jesus. Our relationship should be centered on Jesus. There is nothing and no one more important than him. Would you say today, Lord Jesus, would you take my life and may there never be a day that will go by that I don't recognize the Lamb of God who was slain so that I might be redeemed and have purpose and meaning and value in this life. Father, thank you for your word I pray that this morning we have made much of Jesus because he is worthy of all of our worship and worthy of all of our praise. It's in his name that we pray, amen.